session, if we could put the red button on, thank you very much indeed. And Jim's asked me to make sure if you've got, you know we've been getting this feedback recently when we've been in here, if you've got your phones, can you stick them on uh, aeroplane mode? Because you can still receive emails and stuff by Wi-Fi, but it's just the aeroplane mode, and it'll prevent sort of interference with the recording. Now, if we're happy with that, then we'll look, have a quick look at the agenda. Uh, no apologies. Uh, Jim Wells is going to be in about 10 minutes, uh, about 10 minutes late. Uh, can we remind members to declare any relevant financial or other interests at the committee meeting as applicable? Jim, obviously your business with the, with the bill. Any others? Okay. Uh, move on to the draft minutes of proceedings of the 3rd of June. Inform minutes, m members the draft minutes of the meeting of the 3rd of June are at page 5. Members, are we content that the draft minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? Okay. And if we agree for the minutes to be published on the website. Agreed? Agreed. Uh, matters arising. Not me. Oh. Uh, matters arising. No matters arising at present. Uh, just before uh, Sue comes in uh, for the oral evidence of the Minister's first day brief, uh, I just want to make sure with the uh, letter that we've received that's come from the Minister uh, was dated today and it's on particular reference the Joint Order for Personal Protection Equipment and in the commentary it says your original request was for all relevant emails between officials in the Department and the Irish Government. I note your request for further, uh, further correspondence relates to PPE equipment specifications and pricing. That's there. Uh, one of the questions I have and I've sent an email back to you uh, I heard the Minister this morning very clearly on Good Morning Ulster stating that the uh, order was not with the Irish Government. It was, in fact, with the procurement agency, and he was at some pains to do that. So I think I'll be looking for some clarity, particularly on that question. Chair, if, if I could come in there too. Uh, that whole wording, I think, is wrong and misleading. Uh, our original request was for all relevant emails. The Minister, I think, in his hands sort of the day he was here in the 8th, <coughs> said that he was prepared to, to give us all email trails, I think this terminology he uses. He then goes on to talk about, uh, I note your f request for further correspondence. We never asked for more correspondence. We asked for all the correspondence in the first place. We then had to dig in order to find out that there was days missing and emails missing. Uh, and then when we asked for that again, he's, he's treating that as a further request. It's not. It's the original request all over again. Uh, nine weeks now since they were in front of this committee. So this is substandard and really poor. Any other comments? Uh, can I come in? Jim. Um, this fellow surprised me considerably because my understanding of the first communication from the department in declining the emails was couched in terms these are incidental and insignificant matters. You don't need to see them. Uh, now, we're at the opposite end of the spectrum. I've been told they're commercially sensitive. If they're commercially sensitive today, they were commercially sensitive nine weeks ago. And so so how, why are we having contradictory stories uh, spun to us about this matter? I, I do really think, Chair, we've reached the point where the committee should uh, commence the process of exercising its powers under Section 44. Yep. Yep. Any other comments? Just Sorry, to the Chair, I didn't just get the last part of what Mr. Alistair said there. Sorry, I, I Section said, 44. I thought we'd reached the point where the committee should start the process of exercising our powers under Section 44, that's Section 44 of the Northern Ireland Act, which gives the Assembly the power to compel the production of papers. I would have thought, uh, through the Chair, just that there's uh, elements of this that probably will be covered uh, whenever the Permanent Secretary uh, has given uh, evidence to this uh, committee. So I suggest that uh, we should maybe wait until we hear from the Permanent Secretary as well. Well, enough. I think, sir, since we've got the permanent secretary coming in to us, I think I'd be content with that, Melissa. I think that would be a, a suitable course yeah, of action for that's the fair enough committee. Enough. Yeah. Okay, can we uh, crack on and welcome into? <coughs> Sue. 
Sue, so, come on on in. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thanks. It's been at least ooh, two, three weeks since we've seen you. Exactly. I was thinking that before I came in. This is about my fourth... T well, I know it's not about. It is my fourth time here uh, in as many months. No. Well, we welcome you, and it's great to see you again. Thank you very much. Um, you might think that afterwards, but it is great to see you anyhow. Um, I just want you to draw members' attention to the papers relating to the agenda item. Obviously, the first item is this uh, letter that we received from the Minister of Finance today, reference uh, PPE. Uh, Clark's brief on page 12. Uh, correspondence from USU on page 14. Department of Finance first day brief January 2020 page 15 departmental issues paper page 23 exemptions and related public interest tests on page 83 further copy of the departmental issues papered with many of the reductions removed which is page table page 7 a further clerk's brief including suggested line question table page 3 letter from the chairperson to the minister read the first day brief and redactions page 113 Correspondence from the Permanent Secretary regarding the first day brief meeting on page 114, and an email from the Perm Sec regarding the first day brief meeting on page 116. There's quite a lot there for us all to digest. So, if you don't mind, can you make an opening statement? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Look, um, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee and to provide some context on the first day brief and departmental document that I, provide, that I provided to the Minister. The department, first of all, we had our, our eight-day first, first day briefing for the minister, which was given to him immediately on entering office. And then subsequently to that, we provided a longer issues document as a more detailed position of the ongoing issues in the department. Um, I think this was a very important thing to do. We had you know, not had an executive for three years. Uh, lots of issues to bring the minister up to speed on. And actually, one of the lessons for, you know, learning from RHI was to actually you know, give, that, give that detail. Um, the material provided then to the committee contained FOI redactions, and I take full responsibility for that, and I am very sorry that that, uh, that, that happened. Um, that was a misjudgment, and uh, we should not have done that. Uh, but I fully accept the powers that statutory you know, that the committee has. Um, my subsequent request to meet with you, uh, Chair, and the Deputy Chair, was to explain the reasons behind some of the redactions. And once again, I thought I was not trying to do anything behind anybody's backs. I thought that would be an acceptable practice here. You have to remember that, you know, this is a bit of a learning curve for me as well, working with committees here, very different. Um, and in my last job, I would regularly have had uh, discussions with the chair of the committee that, we, that my department would have shadowed. So no offence was intended, and I realise that I have also caused a bit of offence on that. That was not my intention in doing so. Um, so I think there, you know, as you said in the outset, um, as time has moved on, um, the redactions have become less. Um, uh, but there are still some redactions, and I have obviously said that any discussion of those I would like to have in closed session. I will, have, and once again, you know, I haven't meant to offend anybody. I will, of course, be guided by you about how that should best happen. Um, but, you know, that's, that's me. Okay. Well, for the particular areas about if it, the ones you want to talk about specifically that remain redacted, we can go into closed session if necessary to do that with the committee's approval and then we can Agreed. discuss that. Agreed? We're moving into closed session. Well, do, you, Chair, do, do we want to have the open session first and then whatever can't be answered go into closed session? No, I think I, on this occasion I'll take the chair and I would like to hear what is being redacted and then we can go into open okay. session because that will help inform where we're going to rather than the other way around because then we'll have to go out and come back in again. Okay. So do that. That's what we go into. If we're Agreed. 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 Well, I would say, Chair, just before you, I, I, would I would say it's, it's therefore incumbent on if we're agreeing to the closed session in order to discuss specifically commercially sensitive matters or areas which might be commercially sensitive or whatever, whatever the reason for the redaction is, people would need to be cognizant of the fact that when we go back into open session, they will need to forget what they <laughs> forget what they or, or not refer explicitly. I, I, I trust the members of this committee, Matthew, that we will be suitably. Okay. Um, 
we will Thank be you. suitably uh, agreed and make sure that we don't transgress that particular line. To my party colleague, I think you were too long in Whitehall. <laughs> I, think, I, think might, I think you might. I think you might apply that to both of us. Right. <laughs> or not. Or not uh, right. Uh, we're about to go into closed session. Mark, can you just uh, make us go into closed session? Right. We're now in closed session. Right. Back in open session. Team, have we any questions to ask the prime second? Paul. Uh, so, Thank you very much for your attendance here today, and thank you very much for your time here in closed session, uh, answering the questions that we had put to you. Uh, we can't let you go. Uh, <laughs> can't let you go without trying to address the massive issue that stands before us within this department and committee around transparency and confidence. We received a letter today from the minister. Uh, uh, joint order for, the Joint Order for Personal Protection Equipment. In that letter, he talks about, and I take grievance with it, he talks about our further request, or the request for further correspondence, which relates to PPE quantity specification and pricing. At no time did we ever ask for further information. What we asked for at the start, when you were here on the 8th of April, you and the Minister, we asked for all emails in connection to this order. The Minister gladly availed, and I think it's in Hansard for that day, where he says he will produce the paper trails and the email trails. Uh, nine weeks later, we are still awaiting some of those emails. Now, I note in his letter today, he's saying that they're commercially sensitive, uh, have implications for commercial interests of other jurisdictions and international transactions, both current and in the future, and it's taken you nine, taking the department nine weeks to tell us that. But in the interim, before that, you sent us the email trail. You didn't give us any indication that some days and emails were excluded. We actually had to dig. We asked the question, quite reasonably, after doing a bit of digging, why were there two days missing, the 30th and 31st? <coughs> you then took us to the limit of time where you, we would expect a reasonable response. You then come back and said, the minister came back and says, yeah, there were emails those days, but we didn't think they were part of the original quest because they were about quantities, specifications, and pricing, and there was a fourth element. Every single one of those emails that I have read to date are to do with quantities, specifications, and, and maybe not pricing, but certainly the other aspect, which I can't remember, the fourth aspect. Uh, that's a very low reason and threshold for not supplying those emails to this committee. And worse than that, for not informing this committee that there were two days of emails worth missing. It, it just seems it just seems really off that you would have us you would you would send us an email trail. An incomplete, which you know is incomplete, and not tell the committee it's incomplete. We have to find that out for ourselves, which we'll gladly do because it's our job, and we have personal pride in our scrutiny. But then to go back and ask, you nearly insult our intelligence by saying that it's about quantity, specifications, pricing, and I can't remember the fourth item. Really? Is that the level we are at? And like, we're not unreasonable people. We want to do our job well. We, we see something. This has been a massive public interest issue. The minister has said in the chamber himself, it's a confidence issue. But yet, yet you can't supply this committee with any sort of confidence as to why there are missing bits in this email trail. And there's a vacuum. And we must have that vacuum filled. Have you got those emails? Can you supply us those emails? So I'm going to rely on the letter that the minister has sent to you today. Say that he is now, you know, we, you know, getting legal clarity on the on the position. Nine weeks later. Well, um, I can, you know, have a letter today. <coughs> that is the minister's position. Three paragraphs. Um, sorry, just, just cut across your vice chair and. Look, so we listened to the minister this morning. Good morning, Ulster. 
And when he was asked specifically the question, and good morning, Ulster, about the order with the Irish government, he was very clear and he said there was no order with the Irish government. He, he was abundantly clear on that. Yet, in the letter we have here today, it says the original requests were for all relevant emails between officials in the department and the Irish <coughs> government. What is, what is right? I'm confused. Either we're asking for these emails that include ones to the Irish government, but the minister says it wasn't to the Irish government, so then why would he write to the department today saying that between officials in the department and the Irish government? I, I, didn't, I didn't hear what he said this morning, um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, we both gave evidence. He set out, the minister set out in that evidence session the chain of events, um, and he has set out today in his letter. I don't want to be, you know, I have, I honestly, it, you know, I'm not sure of the point that is being made. Uh, the point is, is that the minister said on national radio this morning, there was no contract. When he was asked the question, he said there was no contract with the Irish government. Yet, in the letter, sure. the letter he's written to us, it said the relevant emails between officials and department and the Irish government. Am I getting completely confused here? Sure. Rather than come in there, I, I, um, there is a letter. I've tried to be as reasonable as I possibly can with all of this. I think the permanent secretary is there. I don't know the whole role within that permanent secretary, but I don't think that we can ask the permanent secretary to, to make a point on uh, a radio interview this morning that some of us may not have heard and some of us may have heard. I know your question is going, but I believe that that's for us to follow through. I don't believe that, and I feel, I feel personally uncomfortable, uh, maybe with the line of question, to the permanent secretary on that just at the moment. I mean, I want it to be fair okay, and that, 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 is, that is noted. Okay, and thank you. I, 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 will, I will accept that, Pat. That's okay. quite right. The Permanent Secretary says she hasn't heard it. 150,000 people in Northern Ireland dead. But I didn't. And yeah. I think there probably will be a whole load more people that didn't hear it either. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't could, hear it. Could, could I ask one question? Up to this point, when we asked for these emails eight, nine weeks ago, the initial response was, well, they're incidental. We decided there's nothing in them for you. We didn't get them. Then suddenly, eight, nine weeks later, we get a letter which says, well, in fact, here's a new reason why you didn't get them. They're commercially sensitive. Well, which is it? When, you know, if they were commercially sensitive today, they were commercially sensitive eight, nine weeks ago. Why this new refuge that suddenly they're commercially sensitive? And how would they be commercially sensitive over the weekend in question to set them apart from the other emails that we have seen? Like they're part of a chain. So the um, you know as you know the China the first instalment of the uh, order from China has been delivered and received. Not this order from China. The, a, a, a lot of the background information, you know, it, the, the, you know, for example, you know, masks have been delivered. Sorry, 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 Prime Secretary. Yeah. The order has been delivered today. Is an order between the Northern Ireland Department of Health and the Chinese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What these emails were talking about was a phantom order, as it turned out, with the Dublin government, with the Chinese. Totally different prospect and order. And in respect of that phantom order, we were told there's nothing in these emails of any interest. You don't need to see them. Now we're told they're commercially sensitive. I'm asking why the difference in explanation as to why we weren't getting them? Why is it switched from eight weeks ago, nothing here to see, move on, to, by the way, they're commercially sensitive. That's why you're not seeing them. Which is it? There are commercial sensitivities in, 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 in the email, and I think I've got to rely on the letter that the Minister has sent. So, so can I ask... I just punch it. That's, that's well, I know that it's not your letter, but I'm sure it didn't go out without your knowledge. 
So you are a party to telling us <coughs> they are commercially sensitive. Likewise, you would have been a party to the first letter, which basically told us nothing to see here. So if you're a party to both letters, what is it that's changed in the meantime? I think that you know we will you know we will come back to you on this, and that's what we've committed to doing. A small one, small yeah, one. Yeah, sure. it, 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 you've you've given us this letter, and that's basically the end of the process for you, until we then <coughs> do something. I haven't given something. you the letter. The, the minister has written you. The minister letter. has written. So so can I ask then if there is those emails, those two days of emails, thirtieth and thirty first. And if there is some element of those emails that are commercially sensitive, why not redact the information that's commercially sensitive and then give us the emails? Sorry, Paul, I'm sorry Vice Chair, I need to cut across you. Just one thing I need to be, Some of the emails we've already received yeah, yeah. Hmm. are by their very nature commercially yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Hmm. So what's the difference between the ones we have received and the ones we haven't received? That is the confusion I have. And those particular dates of the 30th and 31st. And, and also, Chair, and my last point is this: nowhere in those email trails that we have saw or read does it actually say anywhere that, by the way, <coughs> folks, this order will not now take place. There's nowhere in those emails that we have read that it actually brings a guillotine down on the, the original process and the original bit. So we're only getting incomplete. We're only we're getting an incomplete picture. And that just won't do this committee. And I'd, I'd like to put on record, I'm quite saddened to hear that we're probably getting more information from the Irish Minister of Health than we're getting from our own department. And, and on that point, we have what we have through the BBC Freedom of Information to the Irish Republic is we have a list of email trails that itemises each email trail. So I can give you the exact number of email trails for the 30th and the 31st. And it is a real first. We have not this committee, this scrutiny committee. It's a real first that we cannot have sight of that. And it really makes a mockery of scrutiny and accountability and transparency. All the things that we're trying to build up in this place that leads to confidence. And it has, it is in danger of being broken down and torn to bits within months of this place getting up and going with us doing so well around this health crisis. OK, thank you, <coughs> Vice Chair. Lisa? Uh, Five year olds, so it's no one shot a reach. You're very welcome here this evening again. Whenever you came in the door, in fact, our chair had said welcome into the parlour. So said the cat to the mouse. I was thinking that um, uh, it's like a wee bit of harassment there, like on your part, that where you've been subjected to a uh, question that, in a sense, was nearly making you responsible for statements that have been made. Uh, but just going back again to the whole uh, procurement. Uh, episodes. In fact, uh, that's exactly in many ways what it has been. At, uh, from the outset, and I think that the Minister had uh, answered adequately here whenever he did say that all the attempts that they had made initially to set up the uh, lines of communication and with the uh, suppliers in China through uh, their efforts with the Dublin government, that, that had broken down. Uh, but that essentially that we can see now uh, the flourishing of a lot of their work between the Minister of Finance and the Health Minister as well too. When in fact they have not only procured uh, the PPEs as required, and we've had the first uh, 60 million of that delivered, but they also have established uh, lines of communication as well too uh, with the suppliers and that in China. Uh, and is it true to say that many of the conditions that prevailed uh, at the time of them initially attempting to establish this relationship continue to exist today in terms of uh, placing an order with a supplier and sensitivities in terms of maybe the equipment and in particular pricing and the likes of it? And that uh, to pursue this line of questioning in relation <coughs> to an order that didn't materialise that, uh, if anything, it could jeopardise uh, our continuing relationship with these same suppliers in the future. And I actually would go so far as to say that uh, I think every member within this committee uh, should consider that. And one other point I'd just like to make again, that. Chair, just before I do finish, is very often whenever people address someone coming in, they address them 
in terms of this committee. It is not always the case that this committee is of the same opinion of some of the individuals in here, and more than you all share my opinion on this particular issue either. Sure. So I can't pretend to speak for the committee, and more than any other member can either. And I think of that member, and I'm sure he knows exactly who I'm talking about, should take that on board. Uh, but I'd like you to maybe make comment on the initial so, issues that I had made in reference to yeah. the PPEs. So, um, what I and I, you know, I, and I've said this before. Um, we worked our socks off in the department, and I am really proud of my teams, really proud of them. They worked their socks off to secure this. I volunteered to do this. Um, I volunteered on a call uh, with colleagues um, when I realised that Department of Health colleagues were, uh, I suppose, struggling, you know, not struggling, but, you know, had a lot on their plate. Um, there was a shortage of, you know, some departments and agencies had shortage of PPE. I volunteered my teams to work on this, and they have worked very well and very hard in collaboration with, with health colleagues, and well, it has been a very much a joint effort. And um, I can't, you know, I also remember at that time, you know, we in the department were no different to anywhere else. We had our own issues about, you know, staff turning up, getting to work, being able to work remotely. We had all of those issues, and the teams have done outstandingly well. The issues that you talk about around, you know, around supplies and procurement are exactly, you know, st we still struggle with all of that, not just here, in the rest of the UK, in, in, you know, in, in the Republic, they, those issues are still around. We're all chasing, still chasing the same suppliers, the same issues, and that is what we are focused on. And, you know, I think, you know, we talked about FOIs earlier. You know, we get FOIs about the FOI. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of effort that has to go into these, uh, you know, issues and that anyway, I, I you know, that's how I feel. Um, we are doing our very, very best to get PPE to people that need it. And I'm very pleased about the order that's come in today. Um, and a lot of the work that was done previously was not scrapped. It was used to get the current order. Um, it wasn't, you know, work, you know, that was just, you know, lost. We used a lot of that. That I feel very, very passionate about what my department has done. Sorry, you mean the lists that was compiled? Or the connections? Sorry, through the chair. The uh, specification. Chair, sorry, I asked a question and I'm yeah. getting a response. Yes, I, was, I think it's unfair to you just, you just, you, you, just got, you just got to me there before Melissa, before I was just like, <laughs> to sorry, chair. gently reprimand the <coughs> deputy chair. Sorry, chair. But look, I'm just, you know, I'm just very proud of my department. I think I've said to you before, we could take an approach where we are just Department of Finance and be really narrow. And we have not done that. And I, you know, we have stepped up. I mean, I've, you know, the list of things that we have done, um, you know, has has been, you know, we've developed, pack, we've developed the grant schemes in in relate, you know, in collaboration with economy, the hospices package we developed. You know, we have stepped up in a huge way, and I can't thank my staff enough. And it's, you know, many people are not working because they may be, you know, isolating, um, or they're they're they're, they're, on, they're sick. Um, we have got. You know, we've had to move to a situation where 80% of the staff are working remotely. That's not something that's actually straightforward. You don't just walk in from a situation where you have everybody in the department one day and the next day they're working remotely. You've got to get used to all of that. You've got to put a lot of effort into making that all work. I am just hugely proud of my department and I know that, you know, they feel battered. Um, and I don't want them to feel like that. I want them to hold their heads up high. Sorry, I'm standing no, 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 on a I'm bit sorry. of a soapbox. And I, I'm um, sorry, and I know Belusa will not sort of cut me short in this one, but I think from the path of the department, for the majority of not only the finance department, um, but also across the civil service, the civil we service. are very supportive of the hard work that they've done. It has been outstanding, and I think people don't actually say that. Um, and so I thank you very much because I don't think people do talk about the civil service in that way. And we shall very definitely, as a committee, put that on record. Uh, Alice, you get one minute. Chair, just I acknowledge <laughs> that entirely, and, and particularly the great work that has been carried out by 
civil service in every respect. Uh, and it has only been matched by the general public themselves. They have adhered, in fact, to the lockdowns and everything else to ensure we have minimised the impact of yeah. the virus here within our community. And our people are to be credited for that. Uh, but I think in particular for the work that's been carried out, as I said again, in conjunction with <coughs> finance and health uh, and the way they have addressed this whole issue of procurement. And that I would, I would like you maybe just to make a statement on that in relation to the sensitivities of conducting business with Chinese suppliers, that that still can be disrupted in many respects. Should anyone look for further types of disclosure, whether it's on price or otherwise? And that has implications not only for our government here in the north of Ireland, but it also applies to the government in Dublin and in London. Yeah. And I think that there's been great cooperation with yeah. uh, the three different uh, yeah. bodies uh, in that respect. And. Um I think we have all been we have all been collaborating. We have all been learning from each other. There is no point, you know, if if something doesn't work somewhere, it's important we take that learning and that open discussion that we are all having across, you know, with 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 the Republic, with the with the rest of the UK, hugely valuable. But you have to be able to be free and frank in your exchanges, um, and you know, I think that the. China route is a very important route for all of us and is going to be for some time. I think also, I would also say that, you know, that the department working with Invest NI actually um, has been establishing some very good connections with local suppliers. And I think that's going to be hugely important going forward. Um, you know, that local supply route to be able to have, um, I suppose, more immediate supply um, and also to create employment and to create employment opportunities. And I can honestly say this, you know, every day I work, every day in my job, I use my networks, my contacts. <coughs> I have introduced my contacts in the Department of Health in, in London to a number of the local suppliers here who to provide, you know, the visors, the gowns, um, and they are following up on that. This could be, you know, something that could actually be beneficial for the future. Um, we will always need international supply routes as well, and that's why it's really important that we <coughs> preserve everything and that we work flat out to get the very best across the whole of what we can do. And that is all we have tried to do here. Um, and I feel very strongly about that. Thank you. Matthew. Thank you, um, Chair. And I think, um, I mean, I would certainly echo the, your words about the hard work of the Department of Finance and the civil service in general. I am more than willing to say, having been both that um, certainly in a situation like this, civil servants do tend to actually have to do things, and politicians, um, uh, we spend quite a lot of time, for better and worse, saying things. Nevertheless, I think this debate is also about a politician saying things. Um, and the, the questions over the, the order are, in, in a sense, less about um, you and, and, and your department, the civil servants, and more about the way I think this was presented initially. And I think there are some legitimate questions to ask. So just on that, um, Prime Secretary Sue, it would just be helpful to understand. <laughs> Indeed, I know. Yeah, well, you can have that title if you wish. That can, um, I'd much rather the Sue bit. Okay. Um, uh, just, this is my scene, like a, 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 a deceptively simple question: Was there ever an order? In 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 the last evidence session we came here, we said we gave our order. So is there's a sort of slightly Schrodinger's order thing here? It's a slight, we're in a slightly kind of definitional point. The, when does an order become an order? If if um, if you place an order but the order is not fulfilled. At some point, it goes. It, it, is it a request or is it an order? I suppose most people would interpret the word order to mean that the counterparty in the transaction, the per person from whom you're ordering PPE or a pint of milk, has accepted your order, and you will be, and the thing will be expected. And I think that was the common. Uh, um, I think that was the common sense meaning that a lot of people reasonably took at the end of March. But what you're saying is that that there there was no confirmation that. Th that an order would be a, an order was placed, but there was no confirmation that one would be <coughs> fulfilled. We gave our requirements to, uh, you know, procurement to procurement. gave okay. gave the requirements, um, gave our order. So you know, and then it materialised over the next few days. That you know that didn't 
that didn't happen in the way that we we thought it would. Okay. But we gave, you know, I think we've set that out in our evidence. So an order was placed, and it was placed from procurement in sort of CPD in Belfast with the Irish government, with the DFA in Dublin or Invest NI or the IDA. Uh, I think procurement colleagues. I guess we'll see it whenever we, we, we get more. And then um, I, um, when you said the, 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 you know, the links that have been built with counterparty suppliers in China, are we then to understand that the same people, the same suppliers who are referred to in the emails that have been redacted are people, or the organization or the supplier that has delivered the PPE that has arrived in the last few days? Um, or, or is that yeah. sensitive? I think that I'd probably like to think about and come back. Okay. Um, and I suppose my final comment would be that is a, I think we have a, a number of former publicans in the room, including yourself and, and my colleague. Two of us. Pat mm -hmm. Catney. And I would just say that um, I look forward, like lots of people, to going for a pint. So do I. Whenever all <laughs> this is over, I'm sure you do. You certainly are. No good. But if I do go for a pint with the finance minister, <laughs> I'm going to place the order. Put it that way, because I don't want to. My understanding is that I, if right, I place you don't order, have to pay for it. That's a If I place the order for a pint of Guinness, I expect a pint of Guinness and <laughs> with the greatest. I'm respect. looking forward to the day I can go and have a drink. I think we all do. And I'm looking forward to the day when I can get my hair cut. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the to, to apologising to the barber afterwards. who has to cut my hair. But anyway, separate question. Yeah. Okay. And because we've had two cat references, Sean, are we going to have a third one? What? We've had two cat references. Are we ready for the third one? Okay. Yeah. Schroeder. Schroeder. Cat. Oh, never mind. Mm -hmm. Very Cambridge joke. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Over my head then. Sorry. Yeah. Sure, Sean. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring you on. Thanks, John. Thanks, Sue. Uh, it's just coming back from the point there that you couldn't answer, Matthew, was the sensitivity around this, right? And we seriously here as a committee going to dance in the head of a pin, go after um, emails and jeopardise uh, future P orders. Because I think after nine weeks, the good news story is we have a lot of PPE. And as somebody who had a member of the family who walked on the front line three months ago, struggling to get it, I know that they today will be in good humour with the result. So we're going to be dancing in the head of a pin from all of the work that you said that was put in here, and it was good work, and at the same time as we're trying to get 1.2 billion out of the door, protect people's lives, livelihoods, businesses, and all of that. And the sensitivity around this, because it may have been two different orders, but the supply lines, and we all know that even the Germans had been gazumped on airports with a highest bidder bought their PPE, who had the most money. So I think we need to draw this thing to a close. We have a lot more to be doing here. Um, around policy and assistant uh, use and the minister, than every week coming back here, emails that might not exist, emails that was uh, belong to all other governments, emails that may be belong to commercial uh, sensitivity. And we're coming here every week on it. I think uh, across the departments, and see the health minister, there's possibly stuff, and I think he has said it, that he will not be sensitive and won't be releasing it. We have to, okay, if people are covering up stuff uh, for different reasons, but at times we have to be serious. It is sensitive, can't je jeopardise, because we could go into a second phase of um, this COVID. It's not gone, so we need to be prepared. And this is a good news story today. And I want to thank Sue and her staff for the work she's done. Janae. Thanks, Sean. Jim. Uh, Chair, uh, I wanted to ask about something entirely different out of the <laughs> briefing, okay. out of the first day briefing. Um, Ms. Gray, page seven of the original briefing on the north south bodies. It says the north south cooperation implementation bodies, Northern Ireland Order 1999, requires that all bodies prepare an annual corporate plan which is subject to the approval of the Ministerial Council, including finance ministers. Mm -hmm. 
this approval has not been received for 2017, 18, 19, or 20. Uh, is there an update on that? Um, I don't know about those positions. I mean, that obviously it wasn't approved because we didn't have finance ministers. Yes. Finance so that's ministers, what I so wanted to ask you. Under that same 1999 order in Schedule 1, Annex 2, Paragraph 2.1, it says the body, that's the north-south body, whichever one, will receive grants from money voted by the Assembly in Dole Aaron. The north-south ministerial council will, with the approval of finance ministers, make recommendations as to the amounts of such grants. So if the statutory requirement for funding involves approval by the finance minister here in Stormont, and there was no finance minister for three years, how were those bodies funded and was their funding legal? I will have to come back to you on that. I wouldn't. I, I can't answer those questions, and it's not because well, I'm trying not to answer them. I don't know. I, I, I would be obliged because I think it is important to establish for this committee that the expending of money is authorised. Yep. If the statute requirement is it requires approval of the finance minister, and it seems self-evident it couldn't be given unless it came from Westminster. Maybe you could clarify that. I, I can definitely do that. Then I'd like to know how those north-south bodies continue to spend money, and if their expenditure was illegal, um, have the accounts of the various oversight bodies been qualified in that regard? I will take that away. That's OK. okay. I, I might say, say to you the language body only laid its accounts for 2017 on the 24th of April this year, three years late. That doesn't. I, sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think just before just before we draw to close, so and so you'll be glad to think you're coming out of here. Just to go back, and there's a comment you made about sort of sensitivities, and I think both Melissa and sort of Sean have alluded to them about um, uh, procurement, and we're looking at procurement. If we were going through, and I need to be correct in this one, but if you're going through the European Procurement Agency or any of those sort of issues as well, isn't that open and transparent with the people who you're doing the procurement with? And how is that any different from, let's say, the order that uh, the UK government has made in Turkey and the orders that have made other places? Because isn't that subject to normal competition processes? Um, I'm just unsure of why there's sensitivities about a particular company, because I'm pretty certain that if we're making a contract with a Chinese company, uh, the normal processes, and indeed under the WTO rules and all the rest of it, that should be a sort of an open and transparent process when we're, we're, we're making this contract. And if we've made a contract with a, a, let's say, a Chinese company, and it's been done through the auspices of Invest NI and all the rest of it, that's not that shouldn't necessarily be sort of commercially sensitive, the name of the company and the companies involved, surely. Chair, good, uh, normal procurement processes went out the window what? during that period because even as a government like the Germans had bought and somebody else come in and bought it over with their head, this is how difficult it was to... Um, uh, I, I, take your, I take your point, Sean, and your view is noted. However, the, that does not change how international trade works, and it does not change how the law of contract works, and it definitely doesn't change how procurement process works. Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. I was just going to say very briefly, I think and I mean it only partially tongue-in-cheek, but if the department and indeed the minister and yourself, so you have new contacts in, in, in China, I'd be obliged if you could write to them and ask them to stop bulldozing the consulate and bits of the consulate in the Maloon Road, but I... Um, I give you that one. That's the Great Wall of China. Uh, <laughs> Clear and interest. But <laughs> seriously, Sue. I think, that, I think that, to be fair, I think that Matthew's question was slightly different. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think he was asking about the, you know, were they, uh, about the company involved in, with the with the Irish government yeah. and the company involved. They were the same. I was asking if they were the same company. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was a slightly different question. Yeah. But there should be no reason whatsoever we do not, we, know, we should know who this contract is with and which company this is with. This has been public monies. 
this is being done on a procurement process. If this was being done in Europe, we would know exactly who the company was and what the bid was. There would be a procurement process. There is WTO rules that cause exactly the same thing. I don't accept the fact that this has to be kept. I don't think. I don't think. I, so I didn't. I actually thought I was answering a different question earlier. Oh, sorry. No, this is the question I'm asking. Okay. So um, I think the company has been. Uh, and that, I think it was part of the statement. No. Not what I've seen. Okay. I. So if I can add to that, it's not really the company we're purchasing things off that I'm concerned about. It's it's the procurement process. So before the Department of Finance, and you'll know this being the accountant officer, but before the Department of Finance can buy anything of substantial purchase, they need to use their central procurement unit. Yeah. So was the central procurement unit involved in this March order? Yeah. Definitely was. Yep. Okay. And then, of course, the chairman's point about procedures through EU law. Proper procedures have been followed. Um, I said that last time, and I said it again. Okay. And just the final thing: it says in the letter that's come from the minister, he says he's uh, seeking clarity in the yeah. legal position and right to you in due course. Yeah. When's due course likely to be? Um. I'm Wait, you know, wait for the legal legal advice, um, and hopefully uh, it, that will not be that will not be long. Did you? Uh, who were we taking legal advice from? Uh, we're taking it from our lawyers. So it's with the internal within the Department of Finance. Well, they're not. They are not. They may be within. They may be part of the Department of Finance, but they obviously uh, serve the whole of the government. So we should be able to get. You should be able to update us very quickly if we're expecting that uh, evidence from them. Yeah, I mean, it says that, you know, when we get that advice, we will come back to you. Sir Pat. Thanks very much. It's not to do with this. It's a, a change. Am I all right to, to go on that now? Um, first of all, thank you for coming. and It's great to hear you, uh, Sue. And we look forward to having that drink. <laughs> right, yeah, by time. And, and I'll buy. OK. Oh, it'll be a rare <laughs> <laughs> then we'll be queuing up to join us. That would need to be hand started. <laughs> I know. That's all I can say. As the fellow says, one would be too many and 20 uh. wouldn't be enough. But look, that's <laughs> enough for that. But here, uh, so what I was trying to ask is, uh, can you maybe just help myself there? I mean, is there many departments with underspends at the minute? I'm trying to think of where I, I know with the COVID-19 what's coming on. And I'm looking at, uh, again, with some of the money which was to go out to infrastructure, which was held back. Uh, as, could you give us as a committee any idea, uh, any lead on yeah. that, on the so, monitoring rounds coming forward? Is so, right? um, we, the, the monitoring round, the reprioritisation round, they are all underway at the moment. Um, I think we've come to you with our, I think we've written to you with our um, issues for our department. Um, we, um, uh, in all departments, they have come forward with their, you know, the areas where they have potential savings, but obviously they have, I, I suppose, overall the pressures are bigger. Um, so uh, that is that, you know, and we've, we're going, that's an ongoing discussion that is underway at the moment between ourselves and departments. Um, and with a view to wrapping that up as quickly as we can and, you know, going to the executive to see where the, prior, you know, for that discussion on priorities um, and how that will be taken forward. Okay. Right, the cats are finished. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much indeed. Can I just make a suggestion or two? Certainly. Yes, <laughs> yes please. So, um, I, I, mean, I do think, you know, like, for example, your APD issue, you know, your APD issue, really interesting. What would be really helpful, and I don't know whether this is possible, um, but, you know, actually, that's an ongoing discussion that's uh, underway. You know, Treasury are doing a bit of a consultation on it. Uh -huh. um, I don't know whether you've ever thought about getting airports in, getting other people in, getting some evidence together, actually supporting us in the work that we are trying to do. But, you know, with that evidence, if you've got evidence like that, yeah. you could then write to the Chief Secretary or the Chancellor 
and the Transport Secretary copy to us. So I think that's how I am, you know, would really appreciate us all working so together. I will be delighted mm -hmm. to bring the airport. Well, in. I thought you and might be because I particularly the best airport on this island to be able to do that. And I just think I, I actually I found myself the other day looking at it was actually a point that I was trying to look into looking at the Treasury Committee um, in, in in London and actually just fascinated by the evidence that they are taking from business and others about the financial implications of COVID and, you know, the future. And I just wonder, I, I don't know, because I'm obviously quite new to this sort of process, whether there's anything like that that you could do, which I think can only be helpful to us. Um, In the spirit of partnership and cooperation that we all respond to and we all as a committee would wish to be part of, We'll, we'll discuss it, but we'd be delighted to help in any way. Absolutely. I just think that would just be a good thing for you, for you to do. OK? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Chairs, thank you for asking me. Thank you. And just those well, items we had in closed session, I'll not mention the figure, but you were going to get back to us. I will that. do. Thank you. I will do. And of course, we look forward to the emails. Of course oh, we, we do. Oh, we do look forward to the emails. <laughs> OK, thank you very much indeed, Sue. Thank, thank you. you. Look forward to that night out, Pat. Well, great. I'll come quick enough. <laughs> oh. Sure it's tough Make sure to confirm hard. the order whenever you order those drinks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you there as well, and you can buy the second round. I, I, before, I made my first, my first booking for a hotel yesterday at Tim Connemara, who had better be open by the time. <laughs> <laughs> See you all soon. Okay, all best. Yeah. Thanks, Cheers, sir. thanks, Sue. Ray, are you there? Ray? Hello? Ray. If you want to move on and come back to Yeah, that, I'll do that if we can find out. Uh, team, we've got item five on the agenda, which is the oral briefing by Ray's on Jim's bill. But, what, what I, page, sir? but I'll take uh, item six and then we can come back to see if we can get uh, uh, Ray on the, on the teleconferencing link. Uh, number, uh, item number six, the subordinate legislation, uh, statutory rule 2020-91. The Rate Small Business Redundant Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to this agenda item. The briefing note on page 145, the Rates Regulations on page 146, and the Examiner Statutory Rules 12th Report circulated by email on the 9th of June. Uh, this rule will be subject to negative resolution procedure of the Assembly. I'd like to remind members that the meeting on the 6th of May 2020, the committee considered the initial proposal for subordinate legislation and members were content with the proposal. The department has confirmed that there are no changes to the overall policy since the initial proposals were submitted to the committee. I'd like to inform members in the examiner's statutory rules 12th report of session 2019-20, published on the 8th of June, the examiner has confirmed that she is raising no points by the rule by way of technical scrutiny. Uh, members, if we are content, can I put the question to you? Content. Uh, content. The, the Committee for Finance has considered statutory rule, statutory rule 2020 number 91, the Rate Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we content? Content. Yeah. Agreed. Good. If we move on to agenda item number seven, statutory rule 2020-92, the Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers. The briefing note on page 152, the Rates Regulations on page 154, and the Examiner Statutory Rules 12th Report was circulated on the 9th of June. I'd like to inform the members this will be subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. I'd remind the members that our meeting on the 6th of May, the Committee considered the initial proposals for subordinate legislation and members were content with the proposal. And as a meeting on the 3rd of June, the committee considered the changes to the proposal and was content that the statutory rule reflected the rate relief provided that the rule was increased from three months to four months. We are content. Yes. Uh, Informed members in the examiner's statutory rules 12th report on, published on the 8th of June, the examiner has confirmed that she is raising no points about the rule by way of technical scrutiny. And if members are content, are we content? Okay. Put, the, put it to the question. The Committee for, for Finance has considered statutory rule 2020 number 92, the Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regula Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, I'll do that after yep. I've done the rules and we come back to, back to it in just a second. 
Uh, the final one is SL1, the rate exemption for ATMs, automatic telling machines and rural areas regulation. Uh, the briefing notes at page 163. Uh, the rates regulations are at page 165. Uh, the purpose of the draft rule is to reinstate the previous applied rates exemption for separate entities and the valuation list associated with ATMs in a designated rural area. Uh, the rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure before the Assembly. A statutory rule subject to affirmative procedure shall not come into operation unless affirmed by the Assembly. I'd like to advise members this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it is not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. Do we have any comments? Okay. If we are agreed, I would like to put to the committee that the committee has considered the Department of Finance proposal for subordinate legislation in the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas and has no objection to the policy implications of the pros proposed legislation at this stage. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much indeed. Now, can we Ray, are you there? Yes, Chair, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Uh, can we hear everybody can we hear yes. Ray? Yes. Okay. yes. It sounds like he's in a cave. Are you in a cave, Ray? Uh, no, I'm just in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, team, this is the oral briefing by Ray's a research paper on the functioning of government and miscellaneous provision bill, that's uh, Jim's bill, obviously. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following paper relating to this agenda item, a paper prepared by Ray to inform consideration of the bill on page 118. And Ray, can you make your presentation on the paper, please? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so, good afternoon, members. Um, I am aware that the committee has already had a number of evidence sessions in relation to the bill, so what I intend to do is really to draw comparisons where appropriate uh, with the situation in other jurisdictions um, regarding some of the, the key clauses. And just to always caveat, comparing the Northern Ireland institutions, they, they do obviously stand apart in, in several regards compared to elsewhere. Um, but turning first to, to Clause 1, the amendment of the Civil Service Special Advisors Act, Northern Ireland 2013, uh, which deals with the hierarchy of special advisors. So the bill would essentially limit any perceived hierarchy of special advisors to within the Executive Office. Um, in terms of relevant comparisons, uh, Section 7 of the Code of Conduct for Special Advisors in the UK Government does appear to allow for management responsibilities for, for special advisors in relation only to other special advisors. And they are expressly prohibited from exercising management in relation to any other part of the, the civil service. Uh, and similar wording uh, appears in the, in the Scottish and, and Welsh codes. Um, on the issue of disciplinary matters and special advisors, um, the bill states that the code must provide that special advisors are subject to the processes and procedures of the disciplinary code operative in the NICS, and that there can be no ministerial involvement or interference in that process. It also says that a minister who appoints a special advisor is responsible for their management, conduct, and adherence to the code of conduct. Um, now, of course, as members are aware, the updated code of conduct for special advisors published on the 20th of January 2020 um, makes clear that the responsibility for the management and conduct of special advisors, including their discipline, rests with the minister who made the appointment. Um, so what, what is the situation in other jurisdictions? Well, the UK Government uh, Code of Conduct for Special Advisors said that responsibility for matters relating to conduct and discipline does rest with the appointing minister. Um, but it also makes clear that the Prime Minister can terminate the employment of a special advisor by withholding his or her consent to an appointment. Um, in Scotland, it's slightly different because the First Minister is responsible for appointing um, all special advisors, essentially. It is also their responsibility to deal with uh, disciplinary matters, uh, and this is also the case in Wales. Uh, and that, Indeed, this includes adherence to the Code of Conduct. So the role of the appointing minister, Prime Minister and First Minister, uh, are really central to the discipline of special advisors elsewhere in the UK. Uh, and I do think it interesting to, to note the role of the First Ministers in Scotland and Wales uh, and um, really the discretion they have in the, the appointment and oversight of all special advisors. Um, turning to look at the number and remuneration of special advisors, um, well, Part 1, Section 16 of the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010 
stipulates that the UK, Scottish and Welsh governments should prepare annual reports for their respective parliaments with information on numbers and costs of special advisors. And the paper includes the example of Scotland, um, where salaries for special advisors are determined either by a special advisors remuneration committee or by any alternative mechanism that may be put in place following discussion and agreement with the First Minister. And tables 1, 2 and 3 within the, the briefing paper um, provide information on the number of special advisors employed at each pay band uh, in England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, the number of pay bands vary and... Um, but it's probably not surprising that the top pay band uh, in the UK government is significantly higher than the top pay bands in Scotland and Wales. Um, although across all three uh, of those higher pay bands, there aren't that many special advisors uh, on, the, on those higher tiers. Um, moving on quickly just to the number of special advisors in the Executive Office, um, which would amend the Civil Service uh, Commissioner's NI Order 1999. Um, and this sort of does tie in with what I've said previously on the role played by the appointing ministers and first ministers in appointing special advisors elsewhere. And so the bill seeks to limit the number of special advisors within the executive office by limiting the first and deputy first minister to one special advisor each. In Westminster, the UK ministerial code provides that, with the exception of the prime minister, cabinet ministers may each appoint up to two special advisors. Uh, furthermore, the Prime Minister may also authorise the appointment of special advisors who regularly attend Cabinet. Um, now, the Republic of Ireland is, is interesting in this regard in terms of how they, they go about their appointments process. Uh, there, a Minister or Minister of State may request, approval from the, may request approval for the appointment of a special advisor in accordance with Section 11 of the Public Service Management Act 1997. And... What's interesting is if the proposed individual comes from outside the civil service, the appointment requires further approval by the Taoiseach. Uh, and also in the Republic of Ireland, ministers and ministers of state who regularly attend cabinet meetings can have a maximum of two special advisors. Uh, any other minister of state can have one. Um, I'll turn briefly to address section six of the paper, which deals with administ administrative type clauses. I'll return to section five because I think it's sort of sits outside uh, this somewhat. Um, so really, Table 5 attempts to set out the comparisons across the UK jurisdictions in terms of record keeping, records of contacts, and presence of officials at meetings. And essentially, the codes uh, of the UK governments and Scottish governments require a private secretary or official to be present for all discussions relating to government business. Uh, in circumstances where a private secretary or official cannot be present, any significant content should be reported back. And then just, just quickly on the issue of using official systems to communicate, uh, which Clause 9 of the Bill addresses, um, this is actually something that has arisen in the recent past. Um, as the paper notes, the First Minister in Scotland and the former First, uh, First Minister in Wales have both been involved in controversy for using uh, personal email accounts to conduct government business. And in 2017, six ministers in the Republic of Ireland admitted to using non-government email accounts to conduct government business. Um, and essentially, in all of the cases, there didn't really appear to be agreement as to what extent any rules had been breached or how to actually address those situation, situations. Um, Cabinet Office guidance from 2013 um, does allow for other forms of electronic communication to be used in the course of conducting government business. Um, but it does state, however, that substantive discussions or decisions generated in the course of conducting government business should be made accessible, for example, by copying it to a government email address. Um, in terms of registers of interest for special advisors, uh, in the Republic of Ireland, special advisors whose remuneration exceeds the prescribed amount, um, and just in preparation for this presentation, uh, I think that that is somewhere in the region €91,000. Um, must prepare and furnish a statement of the, the registerable interests. Um, and these are interests which could reasonably be seen as interfering or being incompatible with their uh, official duties. And that register has to be submitted to the Minister and the, the Oireachtas. Um, and just as an aside, I think as of July 2019, four ministers had special advisors who, whose pay sort of essentially breached that prescribed amount. Um, the research did not find any specific reference to registers of interest for special advisors in the UK, Scottish or Welsh governments. Um, 
It's interesting to note in Scotland, the Lobbying Act of 2016 requires lobbies to register the names of persons lobbied, which includes ministers and special advisors, but uh, I didn't see anything whereby special advisors would sort of have to do the, the reverse. Um, on the offence of unauthorised disclosure of information um, created by Clause 11, um, special advisors in England, Scotland and Wales are bound by the Official Secrets Act, um, although I think as the bill sponsor uh, noted this would, would sort of be unlikely to relate to the intention behind um, his Clause 11. Um, and the model contracts for special advisors serving in the UK, Scottish and Welsh governments um, makes clear the requirement for, for confidentiality. Um, and finally, Chair, just moving on, or moving back to Section 5 of the paper. So this looks at the proposed rule for the Commissioner for Standards. Uh, and the bill's uh, enhanced remit for the Commissioner uh, for investigating alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code. Uh, and indeed, this is something that the, the previous Commissioner himself had recommended and had commented on previously. Um, the, the New Decade New Approach document sets out how a, a panel of three Commissioners for Ministerial Standards will be appointed uh, to investigate complaints that a Minister has breached the, the Ministerial Code. Um, but, of course, any sanctions would, would remain a matter for the relevant party stroke assembly process. So looking at how breaches, how breaches of ministerial code um, elsewhere are investigated, um, the first thing to say is that there is currently no provision for standards commissioners uh, within other legislatures to investigate ministers. Um, this is the case in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, there are mechanisms for the Prime Minister or a First Minister to seek an investigation into alleged ministerial misconduct. Um, all three ministerial codes of conduct refer to um, an independent advisor, or in the case of Scotland, a panel of advisors, who may be asked by the Prime Minister or First Minister to undertake an investigation. Um, there has been some criticism about the sort of perceived lack of independence of these advisors. Um, specifically their inability to act on their, their own initiative. Uh, and the paper members will, will see refers to criticism um, by the House of Commons Public Administration Select Committee um, back in 2012 um, about the choice of candidate. Uh, he was a long-serving civil servant. Uh, and again, that lack of own initiative power. Um, it was furthermore it was the subject of a Westminster Hall debate in 2016 and at that time, a spokesperson for the government said that the appointment and dismissal of ministers would remain a matter for the Prime Minister. Um, but I think what's interesting, and as the paper discusses, that um, the Standards of Conduct Committee uh, in Wales uh, in 2018 uh, issued a report, um, and it contained a recommendation sort of similar to, to what's contained in the, the functioning of government bill. Um, it recognised the ambiguity between a minister um, sort of operating or carrying out ministerial duties and acting as a constituency representative, certainly when it came, came to complaints. It said that if, for example, a member of the public wanted to make a complaint about a member, they should not end up being signposted to the other channels just because that person may have been acting in their role as minister. Um, so the committee recommended bringing ministerial complaints under the remit of the Standards Commissioner and said that this would increase public confidence in the system. Um, now, in response, the Welsh Government rejected this recommendation and argued that to involve the Standards Commissioner appointed and accountable to the Assembly to investigate complaints about the behaviour of ministers when clearly operating as ministers rather than Assembly members could in itself create the sort of ambiguity of accountability that the Committee's report seeks to avoid. Um, but I, I did think it was interesting that, that uh, a committee and another legislature had argued for that, although, albeit ultimately, it was rejected by the, the Welsh Government. Um, Chair, that's uh, a run-through of some of the, the key points from the paper, and if members have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, Ray, just a, just a, just a uh, technical one. In the case of Scotland, where there may be a coalition, and it's not always the SNP, is it still that the First Minister is responsible for the discipline of the SPAD from another political party, or is that split up in some different way? Uh, sure, so I just missed the first part. Are you saying if it's, if it's uh, in relation to a coalition government in Scotland? Yeah. Well, in Scotland, it's only recently that uh, it's been a one-party government. Normally, it is a coalition. But 
Does the First Minister still have the responsibility then for disciplining special advisers from other political parties? I didn't see anything to the contrary, Chair, uh, when I was researching it, but that is, um, I mean, I can see how that would be potentially problematic. I'm happy to go away and explore that issue further. Uh, yes, please. Th but, thank you, Ray. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, thanks, Ron. Maybe the question can be directed uh, to uh, Mr. Allister as well. But I noticed that on page 136, the proposal uh, in Scotland that the civil service will make and keep an accurate written record of every meeting attended by a minister in departmental services. Um, I just want to note that Jim's bill. How do we go about? I mean, that would, is there some way that that could, could be written into it? I was just to ask Mr. Allister himself or uh, the uh, gentleman there from uh, Reyes. Well, well uh, sorry, any. You go ahead, Ray. Uh, it's, well, it's probably a, an issue for the bill sponsor to answer if, um, rather than myself. Jim? Yeah, well, if I might. It's one of the issues that has been raised elsewhere, and it's a matter that I'm contemplating an amendment to put it in statutory form, because I think it's a good idea. So yes, it's something that I'm cognizant of and hoping to deal with. And th that is possible as this bill goes through, that that can be amended in order oh, to yes. bring that in? Oh yes, That'd be good. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, sir. Jim? Yeah, uh, Ray, I just wanted to uh, take you back to Clause 5. Um, and the idea of extending the role of the Standards Commissioner to also examine breaches of the Ministerial Code. As you pointed out, the Standards Commissioner uh, himself, who we last had in Northern Ireland, um, indicated that could be done very cheaply and indicated the willingness, um, in accordance with an Assembly resolution to that effect, uh, to undertake that role. But could I ask you just to compare and contrast that idea with what's in New Decade, New Approach? And can you confirm that the following is correct? The Standards Commissioner, to whom I want to give these powers, is someone whose independence is guaranteed under the 2011 Act. Uh, and he is recruited by open uh, competition, whereas the three additional commissioners suggested in New Decade, New Approach would be handpicked by the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, even though they'd be investigating complaints against ministers of, over whom they have the major most of the ministers that would be subject to control. First of all, is that correct, that there, there would be open competition for the Standards Commissioner's appointment and his independence would be clear from that, as opposed to the new decade, new approach? Is that correct? That would be my understanding, yes. Yeah. And secondly, in relation to the investigative powers, is it correct that the Assembly Commissioner under the 2011 Act has the power to call and to compel witnesses to command the production of papers and to take evidence under oath, but there would be no such power for any of the commissioners uh, if we went down the new decade, new approach route. Is that right? I'm reasonably confident to say yes, that within the remit of the standards commissioner. Um... Well, I can assure you it is. It's sections 28, 30, and 31 of the 2011 yes. Act. He has powers to call, compel witnesses, produce papers, take evidence on oath, all those things are spelled out in statute. There would be no such uh, powers for the New Decade New Approach Commissioners. Isn't that right? Yes, yes that's my understanding. And the third one, and that is, under the 2011 Act establishing the Standards Commissioner, there are, for good reasons, 20 different disqualifications as to who can be appointed to make sure they aren't just an old hack of government, so to speak. There is no such filter in respect of new decade, new approach. Isn't that right? Again, that would be my understanding. And as I said, that's one of the, the issues that was raised by the 
uh, has been raised in Westminster. Yes, and as you pointed out, the Welsh Committee of Standards very much made a proposition quite like what Clause 5 is, isn't that right? Yes, I thought that I was actually addressing that in a 2018 report. They had recommended something similar that now appears in, in the bill, um, but ultimately it was, was rejected by the Welsh Government. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Any further questions? Ray, thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank okay. You, Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Uh, if we move on to item number nine, chairperson's business, you'd be glad to know there is no chairperson's business. If we move on to item number ten, correspondence, you will not be so happy to notice that we've got a lot of correspondence to look at. Um, first of all. Uh, first thing is departmental correspondence regarding an overview of annually managed expenditure forecasting on page 172. Members, do we have any comments? You can have your seeker agreement to note. To note. Uh, departmental response regarding extended rate relief on page 175. Members, have we any comments? Are we content to note? Great. A uh, response from the Institute of Government regarding the functioning of Government Mrs Leonis Provisions Bill. Uh, ask members of the any comments. And remind members on the 5th of June that uh, Jim saw, or the clerk sorry, sought informal agreement to forward the response to the Committee for the Executive Office. And for, can I seek formal agreement for the purpose of recording in the minutes to forward the response from the Institute of Government to the uh, Committee for the Executive Office? Read <coughs> Um, I'll be very disappointed if you don't talk about this one, Matthew. Uh, departmental response regarding air passenger duty on page 178. Yes, um, it is, um, I mean, I think it's worth putting on the record, and it's not, it's not, it's disappointing, though in, in one sense logically not unreasonable for the department and the minister to say that um, it's seeking to uh, Negotiate with the Treasury on the block grant adjustment that was in, that was agreed in 2012 would effectively weaken the Department of Finance's leverage with the Treasury or its interest with the Treasury in negotiating various other things, um, ongoing negotiations that are particularly acute at the minute. Um, having said that, I think it's worth. I would like to once again put on record how absolutely absurd this position is that we've got into a situation where we are required to. Reduce two million, more than two million pounds every year from the block grant for long haul flights, which I'm afraid are even less likely to return to us in the current context. But anyway, um, statement over. It's a, it does at least acknowledge and explain the situation. Um, I don't think there's any more. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I don't think the committee should investigate any more. Spend any more time on. I I agree about investigating any more, but I also agree about the fact that maybe the committee might note the absurdity of it, and we might put on record. That we think that the situation where we're paying 2.8 million is coming out of our block grant for essentially nothing is, is to use your language, absurd. And I think we as a committee would like to, uh, if we're in agreement with that, I would like to make that as a formal, uh, a formal note and a formal record. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Well, thank you, Matthew. Uh, if we move on to the next item, correspondence table pay, at paper at page 68. Letter from the Committee for Justice regarding the Function of Government Bill. Ask members if you have any comments. Happy to note. Noted. Uh, table at page 69. Uh, table at page 69. Written briefing of the Department regarding the Fiscal Council. Members, have we any comments? Uh, 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 there was correspondence back from the Department uh, on the Fiscal Council, and they said they haven't got round to looking at it yet. Uh, could we ask them, could we as the committee write to the department to start the process of setting this up? As for me, it's very important. Um, can we give a, an ask on that, that we, that we write to them and ask them about setting up? They've used COVID. Yeah. Well, um, I, would like to, I would like to put to the committee that we had today from the permanent secretary who was saying that there was, you know, she would like us to be able to assist, mm -hmm. and I think we could be, uh, we could provide a lot of assistance. So. Yeah. I think we should get in contact with the department and maybe formally write to them and say we'll be delighted to assist them in the formation of a fiscal council. Great. And that would show a, a definite joined up approach between the committee and sort of the department. I, I, I th if I could just chair as well, I think there's a broader agenda because there's a, um, 
there's the Fiscal Council, which is set up in the new approach. There's also the possibility of a Fiscal Commission, which is a, um, and I think, you know, actually these are institutions which are, you know, whatever people's political party, constitutional persuasion, view on public spending, are actually useful and overdue for this place. So I think, I, as we discussed when we did our the COVID forward work, um, I would echo that. I think there's something we can really contribute to there, a piece of work which will be valu valuable. And, could somebody, and I think the minister and, and it, it, it is my recollection, but obviously I don't have hands heard in front of me, but I know that the minister was keen to talk about a fiscal commission, and I think he gave evidence to us here. He was keen to look at a, fish, a fiscal commission as well as a fiscal council. Yes. And I think yes. maybe we should write and say we'd be delighted to assist in the creation of that. And indeed, if it's helping to reduce the burden and looking for suitable candidates for these roles, I think the committee would be uh, amenable to that. Yeah. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Yeah. And I'll work out some wording and we'll circulate a letter about that later. Well, as, uh, do you mean the committee us to be members of the Fiscal Commission? Is that yeah. what you were suggesting? Recommend appointments. Recommended appointments. Recommended appointments. I don't know about you, Matthew, but no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, next, uh, okay. Department response to the Committee for Justice regarding the Domestic Abuse and Proceedings Bill, page 180. Members, have we any comments? If you're content, happy to note. Noted. Uh, Department response to the Committee for Infrastructure regarding the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme. Members, do we have any comments? Happy to note. A copy of correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure to the T Minister for Finance regarding a TransLink deficit, page 183, and tabled at page 73 as a response from the Minister of Finance to the letter. Members, do we have any comments? Where's the, where, 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 could you repeat, Chair, where the letter is? You yeah, page, the, uh, the letter from the Committee for Infrastructure to the Minister of Finance is page 183, yeah. and the Minister's response is in the tabled papers at page 73. Okay. okay. Is that the one that discussed? I haven't got it open. Is that the one that discussed the fact there hasn't been an application for the haulage industry? Yeah, just let me check on that one. That's the TransLink? It's the deficit for the TransLink. No, TransLink deficit. Sorry. Are we content to note? Uh, next one is depart that's the next one's uh, tabled at page 70 uh, Jim the departmental response regarding financial support for yeah. road haulage taxi industry and transport sector I just wanted to express disappointment that the Department of the economy and the Department of infrastructure which I think are the two relevant departments still don't seem to have made any bid for the 59 and a half million pounds it's sitting at the center uh, uh, yet we have a haulage industry which is in pretty dire straits in parts and I just don't understand the diffidence about doing that and why it hasn't been done. Um, uh, speaking as the chair and having read that and having read that letter twice now and also listened to what both the Minister for Infrastructure and the Minister for Economy has actually said in the Assembly yeah. and particularly were referenced that some of our members have raised questions about the haulage industry. Yeah. I am more than a little surprised that there hasn't been discussions about ongoing support and what it is likely to do. And I, I imagine um, many of us have also had responses from people in the taxi industry as well. So it does seem to be that this funding is not being, not being looked at or being accessed. Now, I can't believe that the Department of Economy and the Department of Infrastructure, the civil servants behind the scenes, are not engaging with the, the, their, their relative uh, business community on that on that issue. I mean, I would just say, um, Chair, if I may, that the I think the idea that this 59 million is sitting there idly is not quite right. There are enormous and significant acute pressures in the infrastructure oh. department, including money which has not been allocated for our wastewater system, which is on the verge of collapse and is preventing basically house building in, in large parts of Northern Ireland. So I don't think it's the case that this money and and there has been a for whatever reason, a um, uh, shall we say a diffidence in terms of allocating some of that money formally to the Department of Infrastructure. So I do not believe it's a, it's a case of it sitting idly. So I, you know, I I don't think it's we, we can agree now. That's not to say that there, there's not an argument for support for the haulage industry. I I, I wouldn't necessarily dispute that, but I, I um I think it would 
it's not the case that, that as, as far as I'm aware, that that 59 million is um, is sort of waiting to be claimed by. Um, uh, by you know. Yeah, yeah, but if I could make a point uh, to Matthew, that 59 million is the residue of a Barna consequential for transportation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, you would have thought that therefore the haulage industry would be clearly falling within that ambit would be a ready-made candidate for it. If Matthew is saying that the problem lies with the fact that the Department of Infrastructure have bigger problems, namely NI water, etc., then is are we evolving into a situation where money, which was granted for transport issues, is going to be siphoned off to Why something else? Issues? And are the haulage industry being sacrificed, or maybe that's too strong a word, but are, are they being demoted in those uh, other interests? Maybe just make an observation here, because the one thing we haven't seen, we haven't seen the in-year monitoring yet. Oh. And we haven't seen the in-year monitoring from any of the other departments, uh, I which think... I think, to me, is unless there may be pressures there, and we've heard in closed session, and I won't mention the figure, but there are obviously potential uh, substantial pressures within other this particular department. So, uh, again, for this, it does seem anomalous. But the other thing I would say that until we've seen the in-year monitoring position, I think that's I'm not really sure what. We could be doing at this I, stage. I, I think that's correct, Chair. But I would, and I would also say, legitimate comment that Jim makes. There is also the question of it's. It, there is wastewater, but there's also Translink. Um, tra Translink is not in a good position financially, and money has not that 59.5 million. It may be may well be that the best use of that 59.5 million is to um, to help ensure we have a, public, a viable public transportation system at the end of this. Bear in mind, there's basically been it has had a you know a tiny proportion of its normal revenue because people haven't been getting trains or buses in anywhere near the, the normal number they normally would have. So all of that needs to be considered as well. So I think I, I agree with you that waiting to see the, the, the next monitoring round might be a... Well, of course, we were informed that the bids were going to go in on Friday. Mm. So okay. we should be seeing in your monitoring sure, fairly shortly. By the time the monitoring round comes, it's too late. The money's been allocated, as it were. Yeah. Uh, I must say I'm suspicious that the haulage industry is being left out there, because two weeks ago I asked for a Zoom call with the Economy Minister and the Infrastructure Minister and representatives of the haulage industry, and I'm still waiting. Mm. I think this money is going to be gone, and then we're going to have tea and sympathy for the haulage industry. Should we ask the question of both departments, sir? Well, can we? Can we? Through the... I think it's probably we should ask the question of the committees. Are they content with the potential allocation of the 59.5 million, or well, maybe the letters? Yeah. What's their understanding of it? Yeah. There, there has sure been a, a sort of ongoing correspondence between the committee for infrastructure and the finance minister in relation to this, and the committee did agree was it last week or the week before that to write to both the committees and the ministers to say that it would support any uh, fully costed proposal. Mm -hmm. but, but not unreasonably, but that's not unreasonably the finance minister has said, give me a proposal. Yeah, because I, I, sense from, um, I sense there's a degree of frustration with the finance minister not putting words into his mouth, but mm. the fact is that nobody's come to him yet. Yeah. Can I ask, Joe, who's, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to see for myself, I, Whose department does it sit with? Does it sit with the economy? Does it sit with infrastructure? At the moment, it sits with finance because yes. it hasn't been allocated. Uh, the 59 million, but yes. who does the haulage industry yeah. sit yes. with? Yes. I think it straddles both in a sense. Yeah, well, then, do you know, there's, we need to ask the question of them. Yeah. Yeah. Could we have a proposal then that I we. I propose we write back to both committees for infrastructure and economy. Uh, and as far as we can, disappointment that it seems nothing has yet been proposed in respect the of the origin. And maybe add something about uh, liaisons with the, the industry itself yeah. Yeah. to deal with sort of potential pressures that they may have. Yeah. And, and what, what 
what's their understanding as to who should make a bid mm. um, on behalf of the transport industry? Mm -hmm. Because you can see where there is. I, I think it falls into infrastructure, but but there's a business element to this. So yeah, I think I think I mean it sounds like we are we are being asked to make as a committee we are being asked to make representations um, to effectively adjudicate between different departments and different or to kind of implicitly we are being asked to give our view about where certain budget lines might sit in the context of a kind of economic crisis basically where different sectors require support um, and those departments themselves are under acute spending pressure and it is um, uh, and, you know both economy and infrastructure have acute spending pressures I think it is um, uh, I don't think our letter should look like forward leaning in terms of us adjudicating because we are not that, that's, that's not our job but if we did want to write a letter I think it might one way of doing it might, might be saying there have been what are, what are your committee's respective understandings of where responsibility lies for um, outstanding issues or something like that you know it's not to say that support for various industries isn't necessary and completely arguable of course it is but I'm not sure we should be endorsing the idea that that they sit with a, a particular department yeah and I think from our perspective our view is to overview the finances there's 59.5 there we believe there are problems with the haulage industry and the taxi industry and, and other Translink. industries as well <laughs> and we should be you know is it is, is it going to be allocated if it's not going to be allocated can we be using it more for other other purposes and um, well the, the there is an argument about the so there, there's a, there is a definitional challenge that was a Barnard consequential that came to spend on transport. on transport you know it, perfectly what well, you could you could argue I think quite reasonably that the, um, that you know that would most obviously include the public transportation system which is translink which is the, the wholly owned public transport system so I think that needs to be part of how we how we frame how we frame it. I don't know if, if, if it's worth the uh, clerk kind of providing us with a, a draft letter for us Matthew, to comment on. Ma Matthew, so not to disagree with you, colleague, um, but all I want to find out whose department it sits with. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go into the technicalities of it all. I want to know if it sits with infrastructure clerk, or does it sit with the clerk. We can do that clerk to clerk, Pat. Yeah, well, that's yeah, science, I mean, that's, the that's what I want there, to see, find out. But that's, that's a, it's a, different, it's yeah. a different question we have. But I, think the, but I think the point is, Pat, that sometimes it's not always it black and white. Really obvious. It's not black and white. Nothing is in this political game. <laughs> <laughs> At that stage, with the actions that we have agreed, are we content to move on? Right. Yeah. Uh, some good news. Uh, page uh, 72, the National Crime Agency has offered to meet with the committee in July. Jim? Chair, uh, they've just confirmed a basically at the start of this meeting that they're available at 10.30 on the, in the morning of the 1st of July. So that will be before the, the committee meeting at that date. Sorry? What, what day of the week, sir? That's the Wednesday. The Wednesday. It's immediately prior to the committee meeting that right. day. Excellent. And just while we're talking about... Would that be here? Or? I, I think room 115 is booked. It can be extended into the, uh, the members' mm -hmm. dining room, so it will create enough space to... And, and in the person? Their meeting yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Uh, do you just want to talk about changing the time of... Uh, sorry, 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 just before you do that, does that mean that the request we made last week for some do briefing document, anticipating the actual meeting wouldn't be for some time, that there won't be a briefing document before that? I, I'm not sure, but I can check that. Yeah. Yeah, we just want to brief about the timing change. Yes. Um, because of, of more uh, pressure to, to meet in the Senate chamber uh, and in an attempt to not restrict committees too much, a uh, committee has been asked to meet in for the next three meetings at 12.30 to 2.30 to allow another committee to come in afterwards for another two-hour slot. I would agree to that. I think we're content. Great. <laughs> okay. uh, if we move on then to, I seek your agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence. Okay. Uh, forward work program. I'd like to inform members of the updated forward work program uh, to July 2020. Uh, advise members of raised research in relation to the function of government bill regarding the independence commissioner for public appointments. Northern Ireland has been scheduled for the meeting on the 1st of July. That should be interesting. 
advise members that guidance was issued on behalf of the uh, committee's liaison, uh, chairperson's liaison group last week in relation to time slots, which has just been briefed on, and we are content, I understand. Uh, ask members, do we have any other business? Can I raise uh, an issue? Uh, it goes back to the point that Jim made earlier about our Section 44 powers. Before we would do anything, uh, I think I would like a briefing from our legal expert as to the actual powers that we do have that we mm -hmm. could enact, and also their understanding of what should, what this committee should expect uh, from information that could well be. Uh, Redacted for freedom of information. What's the difference between a scrutiny committee's role and uh, request for information compared to a member of the public or the media? Uh, and also, if it's possible, to find out some sort of, in their opinion, time scales and timelines around legal advice procedure and how long it could well take or reasonably expect to take a department to come back to a committee when they're looking yes. for that information. Are you happy to take that? We'll get the clerk to do that detail and then brief us. Sorry, uh, Chair, can I, can I, uh, if, if the committee is considering uh, Section 44, then the first step in that would be to seek legal advice All right, okay. uh, specifically okay, right. on so, that. No, no, so that's fine. If members are content to seek yep. that and then seek further legal advice, so to split those up into yes. two different yep. okay. requests for legal yep. advice so that they're not messed up if and when they okay. go to the Speaker. Okay. Right. And just to the chair as well, uh, it would be remiss of us, I think, that and given all the procrastination that has gone on here about uh, PPEs and that, that we uh, wouldn't uh, send uh, that letter of congratulations to uh, the Minister of Finance and to our Health Minister for the good work that they have done in ensuring uh, the supply of PPEs, and in particular the first delivery, which was today, 60 million of it, and I've seen two that were the largest airplane in the world has actually landed in the only airport in Ireland that can accommodate it in Shannon and uh, it is there supplying to us in Ireland and in Britain as well too many of those PPEs so I do think that I would propose that we send that letter of congratulations to both our ministers for the great work that they have done in that respect. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, no chair I don't agree I think we have a minister who has been duplicitous with us about the whole issue of PPE I certainly welcome the fact that at last we're getting some extra, uh, but I think that the, the, to congratulate a minister who has paid cat and mouse of this committee over what exactly was and wasn't being attempted with uh, Dublin, uh, and then to try and give him some cover by congratulating him for uh, eventually obtaining what he told us was being obtained weeks ago. So I certainly wouldn't be agreeable to a letter yeah. in those terms. Jim, I wouldn't want to be associated with that either, because not only that, he invented the story of the health and safety executive PPE equipment, yeah. which has absolutely nothing to do with the issue being yeah. discussed. Why he simply didn't say, look, folks, I thought I had it in the bag. International competition led to us losing the contract. It didn't exist. I would have respected him. But instead, he's gone on a sort of a, a wild goose chase, chase for nine weeks, trying to basically to cover up what had happened. And I want nothing to do with any letter of congratulations to that minister. Okay, so that's. Sorry, to the chair, I made a proposal. Yeah, that's, well, that's what we're getting to, Melissa. Yeah. Sure. Sir, can I just make a point? Right, um, the permanent secretary said when she was here that basically the minister and the department could have sat back and done nothing about the PP situation. Um, so I think actually he did everyone a great favour, him and the department. He mentioned that he worked along with the health minister, he worked along with the economy minister. So I actually think the letter of congratulations is the least we could do. Uh, Paul, you indicated previously you were content for that. Yeah, but to be honest with you, we need PPE and we need our ministers to get PPE. So I have no problems congratulating a minister in person for, for getting PPE. That doesn't at all negate the issue that I have with this minister with regards to what I believe the, the secrecy and the lack of transparency around the original bid and, and, and order contract. So uh, that, that doesn't diminish. I, 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 I would be quite willing, so I think it would be good to send a letter. I, think, uh, I mean, 
I'm slightly bemused as to what the letter would what the letter would say. I mean, I, I so I think two things. We need to be honest about the fact that they're that we're politicians. The minister is a politician. Um, the department and the permanent secretary have worked extremely hard, and I don't doubt that the ministers work very hard, as has Robin Swan, the minister of health, as of all minister, all ministers. I think we do have to appreciate that by by writing a congratulatory letter, it's a it has a, a kind of it does have a political meaning or context to you. So I'd, I'd sort of like to see what what this draft letter looks like, but I, I think it's, I'd, I'd I'd rather be. Um, Instinctively, it seems a bit strange to me, to be perfectly honest, to be sending letters of congratulations when we are fundamentally a scrutiny, scrutiny department, but I'm happy to look at a draft. Sure. Um, I think, sir, Sean, want to come in there? No, no, I support it. Well, Lisa, I think just listening to the views we've had mm -hmm. around the committee, yeah. would you like to circulate yeah. a draft to the committee that we could consider? Uh, well, I think that uh, you're quite capable of that yourself, Chairman. In fact, it's not the first time that letters have been Turn sent me me from this committee. Down. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that should be done on behalf of the committee, not uh, on my behalf as an individual member of it, but on behalf of the committee. And those that dissent from it, they have the opportunity of voting against it. He will. Sure. And I'll just say, uh, the Department Secretary was there today, and I have no doubt that whole team worked hard. We are where we are now. Do you know? So, I mean, we've got this has landed, it's there. There is a, all what's went on before that. So. I would be. Um, I, I, I would second our, our vote now in order to send a letter to the health and to the finance yeah. department yeah, and congratulate by, them. By way of compromise, could we write a congratulator, congratulatory oh, yes. letter to the minister, and then also within that letter asking for the emails? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right. There's a formal proposal on the on the table, and I'll second it. So uh, we will. All those in favour of. Sorry, can I just get a. In sorry. Uh, do members want to include officials in that too? Yes, Again, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. To, to write to the Minister of Finance and, and the health. Minister of Health, health. and their officials to congratulate them on their efforts in securing the order for PPE, which today's was delivered on today's order. Was well, well, sure, can, can we wait it now? Because there's been more batches of PPE have arrived over the last number of weeks. Uh, well, not just this one order. I, uh, but I, I do think of this particular order in itself not only pro not only provides for our needs at present, but it is an ongoing and continuous uh, process as well to into the future. And that. so I do think that they're to be commended for the great work in securing that particular supply line. And it doesn't ignore it doesn't ignore in any respect a lot of the good work that's happened throughout the rest of the country and people producing PPPs and everything else. You know for uh, different uh, providers, but in terms of establishing and securing the supply line, uh, not only for now but for the future, I think that they'll be commended. And let's face it, you know, uh, people have taken every opportunity they could to be very, very critical of them to date. Uh, and in this respect, I think it's about time that we did um, accord to them that kind of praise that they deserve. Right. Can I ask the chair? Are you sure that it's a secure order? I'm sure about this. How, how, are you, how are you sure it's a secure order for the future? Sorry? So how, how you, 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 you say can to I make a, can, I, can I make a chairperson's yeah, ruling here? I am making price. a chairperson's ruling here. We have reached, we have, I think we've reached the stage where we, I will circulate a draft letter of thanks to the Minister of Finance, Minister to Health, the two departments on the recent PPE yeah. order and the moving to PPE. We will circulate it. It will be up to you to decide whether you agree to it or not. We will ask the people who agree to it at the time or not. And if we get a majority of it, I will sign said letter and uh, uh, send it. Agreed. Agreed. Wait. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? That, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Date next time of the meeting, 17th of June, 2.30 in here, Jim. Uh, 12 no, 12.30. 12 12 yeah. 17th of June, 12.30. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That's it. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.